was a time of a preacher when a story begun. How you doing tonight, folks? Glad you have tuned in to join us this evening. I hope a few people have joined us. It's a beautiful night here in Walton County, so much different than last week. Uh, so sorry about what was suffered here last week. I was just telling Garrett, it looks like the fire tonight is in Collier County, which is down at Naples, Florida. Massive brush fire tonight there. So uh, our prayers are with them tonight as they battle that blaze i don't i'm not sure exactly where it's at i know it's somewhere along interstate 75 down there so uh, hopefully folks will be okay right beautiful day today gary yeah i got a little bit of sun today i see that i see that i That's got a little good. bit of sun while getting whooped yeah yours truly yes. ronnie mcbrayer yes we took a recreational day today just so you know and uh it was a birthday present for me garrett turn how, how what was your birthday this past weekend uh double trace Double Trace. Yeah, what a child. What a child. Your happy birthday to Garrett. I hope you all light him up in the comments tonight and let him know that it's thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have a have a birthday. And It was fact, last Friday, so if you missed it, I mean, you can still have, tell me happy birthday. I'll, yeah. be, I'll be okay with that. Yeah, but, you know, he likes nachos. and uh, I do. He likes hot wings, and he likes to play golf. So, you know, you could do any of those things to help <laughs> him out. And... Uh, he really has an interesting week around his house on the week of his birthday. Aaron, Garrett, two children. Garen and Garrett and, and the two children have birthdays within days of each other, all within the same week. Yeah, so, cool. uh, yeah, Sammy's was last Tuesday, and then mine was on Friday, and then Graham's was Monday, and then, of course, Mother's Day was Sunday. Oh, so wow, just, a lot of celebrating going on. Oh, absolutely. Great. I love it. All right. Well, happy birthday, Garrett, and... Uh, Thanks. Glad man. we saw a little sun for the first time in a while and uh, enjoyed that. We'll see what happens with things opening, closing, spiking, not spiking. It's still hit and miss around here. People, you know, we, we do these questions on Wednesday night. People are saying, hey, when are we going to get back to church? I just, I, mm, I don't know. I'm hoping June. And uh, I, I, I know that some churches that have decided to open are doing some really interesting things about how to get people in right like three services uh first hundred people get in the door with distance seating and uh i don't know that's really weird to me the the logistics of it are yeah. just almost too chaotic for it to yeah really and and if you do have someone sick you know they try to keep everybody in pods and groups but it just takes one person who's ill in that situation to break their contain and right. i don't know it's just right. uh, a lot of liabilities there too and so anyway, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, like ju hopefully, sometime in June. Sometime in June, soon June. So uh, we we uh, Garrett and I had a, a long distance Zoom call today to Northern Ireland yeah. with uh, Richie, uh, who runs Riot, and that sounds terrible, but Riot <laughs> stands for Revival in Our Town. Revival in Our Town in the town of Dundrum, Northern Ireland, just Dundrum, outside of yeah. Belfast, and. And everything is shut down there, and they were talking about nothing till, should we say it, Christmas. Yeah. yeah. Holy smokes. Yeah, they're just they're just now implementing changes, really, for the first time. But, yeah, we, we have a couple good relationships with uh, some people over there that are doing mission work. And, yeah, everything's just been closed down. Everything I've heard is they really can't get out and go anywhere. And yeah. really just to pick up food. And Rich, Richie has to be especially careful. His wife is in cancer treatment right now for breast cancer and has a couple more chemo therapies to go. So he's just being ultra, ultra uh, conservative on his social distancing. Well, tonight we're going to talk about the Bible. Oh, I smacked my hands right in front of the microphone. I apologize. I'm not Hercules. always 
always <laughs> accustomed to this yet. Uh, we're going to talk about the Bible tonight, and uh, we had a couple different questions come in this week. One was about specifically a book that did not get in the Bible, the Gospel of Thomas, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then a second question, very good question, was about the Apocrypha. Now, if you come from a, a Catholic background uh, or, or an Orthodox background, you're ha- going to have some familiarity with the Apocrypha. Uh, Protestants typically do not. It's a dozen or so books that are supplemental to uh, the Old and New Testament. And it's a really good question. Someone said, you know, what's this, uh, what's this Apocrypha all about? And am I going to get in trouble by studying it? And the, the person who asked the question referenced a verse in the book of Revelation, of course, uh, where in the book of Revelation it says, you know, cursed is he who adds to or takes away from, from the sayings in this book. Uh, that statement is made specifically about the book of Revelation, not about the entire canon, because the entire canon as we have it today had not even been completed yet. And we'll get, we'll get into that as well. But great questions. And then uh, don't let me forget, as we finish up tonight, that uh, we'll pray prelude next week's question, which is another really good one that will going to give you going to give you some homework. It's so good, I haven't even heard. Garrett hadn't even heard it yet, so I hadn't even shared it with him. So let's talk about the Bible tonight. There are a couple approaches I think that's that's helpful as we start. I believe that so much of the Bible is descriptive more so than it is even prescriptive. So, what do I mean? That is, when we read the Scriptures, we are eavesdropping, witnessing people's understanding of and encounters with God. Rather than this entire everything being a commandment. From Genesis 1 1 to Revelation 21, everything is thou shalt. The Bible is not constructed that way. Uh, so I take the Bible much more descriptive. This is describing the ancients' experience with the divine, where often we take everything prescriptive. God's telling you, you must do it this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and you get into a lot of interpretive uh, trouble. Uh, that way, uh, and going ahead and, and tipping my hat, and tipping my hand rather, we talk about the Bible as the Word of God, and I'm comfortable with that. But the true Word of God is Jesus of Nazareth. He is the Word made flesh and dwelt among us, and I have taken for a number of years, at least the last fifteen that the Bible points people to the true Word of God, and that is its primary function, and the true Word of God being Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ. So I'll, I'll say that up, up, up front, sort of as the, the prelude and the framing to, to a lot of different things we'll talk about tonight. Uh, whenever you talk about where the Bible comes from, probably the first word, the first doctrine that you have to deal with is inspiration, the doctrine of inspiration. So, Garrett, you've been to Bible college, you've been to to seminary. I'm sure of all the things they don't get to in seminary and Bible college, they probably got to that pretty quick, did they not? Oh, right, yeah. Uh, And there's all, all these different theories about inspiration. Inspiration literally means God breathed, the breath of God. So when we say that the scripture is inspired, we are saying that that God God's breath produced it, and breath being spirit, breath being life and light, mm-hmm. uh, or a pneuma, 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 yeah, yeah. Pneuma yeah, is the, the the Greek word mm-hmm. for breath, life, breath, life, life, spirit. Yep. Uh, so. Inspiration, but as is true in most doctrinal issues, what people decide that inspiration means means different things for different groups. Yeah. So I was brought up in, uh, well, well, 
the first, probably the most, the most uh, fundamental approach to inspiration is something called dictation. That the human writers of the Bible were literal typewriters. Mm-hmm. God spoke and their pen moved. Uh, that has some adherence, but that's not a very popular view. Uh, all, all, and and I, I think if I pushed the you know the 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 preachers of my childhood and my upbringing and my religious formation, if I pushed them and asked them what they really believed, even them, I don't think they would believe necessarily that. But some do. They right. believe that that the word that the words were so careful and so inspired that that God literally spoke the words through the mind and and the understanding of a person and it produced it on paper. Right. And and typically what you see is, you know, the the conversations we've had the past few weeks, you know, about Abraham and and Isaac and uh, your take on that and your take on the crucifixion. Usually you see all those things coupled together with with your idea uh, of interpretation of how the Bible came to be or the inspiration, right. where it came from, how it's shaped and formed and put together. And what I see more than, than the dictation theory is I see the verbal plenary. That's, that's the other one. That I see that much more often. And that one means that the words, the actual words are inspired. They, they may not have been necessarily dictated, but as people were moved by the Spirit of God, they wrote, these words are inspired. And philosophically, it's a very much of a foundationalist approach. We may have talked about this. We're seven weeks into these Wednesday night things, so, and you and I talk afterwards, so I can't remember what's been videoed and broadcast and what's not. But foundationalism says it's a way of believing, very much post-enlightenment, that here are all my beliefs. They're, they're put together with all these little bricks like Lego blocks stuck together. And foundationalism says if you remove, we did talk about this. Mm-hmm, yeah. Foundationalism says if you remove one of those bricks, if you remove one of those blocks, then the entire thing will fall down. The plenary verbal view of inspiration holds to that. Every word is equally inspired. Therefore, every word has to be kept. Every word carries the same amount of weight. Now, my guess is that the preachers I heard preaching growing up would would fall in there. I was too young to have that conversation. <laughs> uh, certainly my first my first uh, staff position at a church, the pastor there, certainly that was his view. And I would say that I went into formal education with that view. Pretty much because it had, I'd been shaped by that view. Yeah, <laughs> your experience the same with that. One? Um, uh, y- y- you know, it's. I mean, you don't have to call out former pastors. Oh, I will I mean, <laughs> by name. No, no, no. Um, it, it it's hard to to really recall, you know, growing up what what was taught, what what was preached on necessarily, um, as far as inspiration, but. Um, you know, it, it's not necessarily every single word carries all the same weight, but you know, this is the word of God. It is inspired by him. Um, it carried a lot of the, you know, almost like you said, descriptive yes. position, mm-hmm. which is, <clears throat> you know, a man is sitting down, God is sitting on his throne and he's, um, you know, almost grabbing a hold of their hand and writing the right. words out for them. Right. Now I, that may not have been what they meant by, you know, but that's how it's communicated. The, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't recall, you know, specific things beyond that, but yeah, my, my upbringing was along that note of this is the inspired word of God and infallible and, uh, right. yeah, uh, without air. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get to those words in a minute. But uh, inerrant. That I, I'm, I'm inerrant. My brain's kind of gone today. Uh, 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 another theory is, and you've touched on it there, is conceptual. We don't have to take every single word, but we take the concepts with those words as inspired. This is yeah. very popular today. It's very much a mainstream 
evangelicals, mainline uh, Protestants. There's a lot of folks who fall into this category of conceptual inspiration. Mm -hmm. Uh, It gives a little more uh, nuance to interpretation, things like that. And you don't, you, you can read, you know, Leviticus 13, but make light, uh, not make light of it, make sense of it in view of, you know, something my, Paul might say, rather than creating this flat platform where, right. where it all carries yeah. the same weight. Uh, and then there's, of course, the, there's another theory called the dynamic theory, and that is, and this, this one's a little troublesome, it's real, it's real popular in, in more progressive uh, Christianity of... Yeah, parts are inspired as it pertains to faith, but not everything is inspired. There are historical inaccuracies. There are uh, concepts that are rooted in their time and place and not universal. Uh, There are uh, errors made by the scribes, so you have to do a lot of of, uh, work and sifting and textual work to, to... weed through those things that's the dynamic approach very popular in like i said progressive circles and then probably the last one that i would point out and there's i mean there's probably 12 more but the last one i would point out would be very bardian uh, named after Karl Barth, one of the most influential theologians of the 20th century anyway german theologian swiss german theologian and his view and I'll, I'll get in trouble with my Reformed friends again here <laughs> because I, I really, I, I would have to say that I'm Bardian. Uh, I wasn't Bardian necessarily 15 years ago, but I am now. His view is that the Scriptures are a pointer pointing us to Christ. Yeah, like a conduit, a vessel. Yes, and yep. and that it doesn't, it, it requires you to wrestle with the text. But it doesn't require you to take every single word and give it the same amount of weight. Again, a lot more, a lot more nuance, because Bart's concept was the revelation of God is Jesus Christ, and the Scriptures move us toward Him. That is how it is the Word of God, because it points us to. Right. The incarnate God. Yeah. And believe it or not, all of these theories of inspiration are actually getting at the original questions that we had. Yeah, which is, which is, how? How do we get how did the, we Bible? Get the Bible? How do, why? You it's know, a great, if I'm great question. Study, if I'm going to study the, the Apocrypha, uh, am I going to be okay? Why is the Gospel of Matthew in and the Gospel of Thomas is out? Uh, there's a, there's a lot of, of dynamics there. Uh, let's just start with the Old Testament. We talked about it some last week about the theories of how the, the Old Testament came to be. And we, and, and the person is out there who's probably listening. And if they are listening, they should comment right now. You know who you are. You said that I just took the Noah and... In Genesis stories and made you cry because I said it wasn't true. I did not say it wasn't true. I said that there's different ways of viewing it. You know who you are. So let's <laughs> go back to there. Let's start with the Old Testament to answer these two questions about the Apocrypha and, and then the additional Gospels that are out there. Um, when we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about a library of books. The Bible is not really a single book. This is my ordination Bible, by the way, Garrett. A long time ago. Yeah, how long ago was that? Oh, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, So, you know, here's this giant book, but it's 66 individual books arranged in categories. Uh, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, and... This constitutes what is known as the canon, not something you fire uh, I, I munitions was, through. I was going to picture, put I, a picture I, up I of know, a canon. I, I opted not to. But canon means uh, 
Reed, it means measuring stick, ruler, standard. So there is a standard that was set for what gets in and what does not get in. Uh, there had to be, what's the word we use in politics these days, vetting. There had to be vetting of each book as to whether or not it would have enough credibility to be regarded as scripture. So in the Old Testament, what we have is the Old Testament today is finalized sometime after the Babylonian conquest of the nation of Israel. So the Babylonian conquest takes place 586 B.C., 586 years before Jesus. All of Israel is destroyed, enslaved, or scattered. And there are 70 years in Babylon. In that 70-year period in Babylon, the scribes, the priests, they begin to gather all the oral stories. They begin to gather the written fragments to constitute what we know as the Old Testament today. About 150 years before Jesus, uh, rabbinical and Hebrew scholars working in Egypt produced the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. So when in the New Testament, even is Jesus speaking of the law of Moses and speaking of the prophets and speaking of what we would call the, the Old Testament, they would refer to it as the Hebrew Scriptures, the best line of thinking is that they are speaking of largely the Septuagint. And the Septuagint, for the most part, was what we have today as the Old Testament. 150 years before Jesus. Right, and, and I think it's important, too, to point out that uh, a lot of these <clears throat> stories in the Old Testament um, were, were dated 15 to two, 1,500 to 2,000 years prior to that. You know, the story of Abraham, you know, if they're dating it, and a lot of scholars would agree that it, they believe it happened around 2,000 2, B.C., BC. And, and, and those same scholars would say that the conservative approach to that is that the story of Job, the story of Job, right, yeah. is even older yep. than the story of Abraham mm -hmm. because of syntax, names that are used, uh, all, all those things. So it's an extremely old uh, story. And, that, and, and that's, you know, I, I bring that up too to also point out that that's not to say that they're not reliable stories no 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 not at all B because of you know and i don't know if you're getting into this tonight or not um but oral tradition um <clears throat> i think we'll get to part of this in a little bit which is um how they vetted as you mentioned mm -hmm. how they vetted certain books uh to fit into the canon mm -hmm. you know what we have as the library the books of the bible yeah the, the oral tradition was um you know these stories were passed on generation after generation um and it wasn't just you know these folklore stories these were heritage stories well and and, and immediately when you say oh <coughs> well two things there garrett well they're just stories there's no such thing as just a story mm -hmm. first of all and second of all you're not diminishing the importance of the story by calling them a story or an oral tradition it's proving their lasting power now, if Abraham did live 2100, 2000, 1950 B.C. and it's 500 B.C. before they write it down, are you kidding me? Now, does that mean the story has flexed and grown over time? Probably. But what a, what a foundational story it is to be able to tra be transferred like that. That there's right. a spark of the divine in the just the oral telling of the story before right. it's ever put on, well, I say paper, on parchment. It wouldn't even have been put on paper. Right, and, and, and these these stories were were passed along from, you know, throughout all the tribes of Israel. And one of the one of the key ways that they they you know vetted these and put these together and compiled these is these stories, different you know, the different tribes of Israel they're they're all the same mm -hmm. 
the, you know, when the, when one tribe and one family tells a story, it's the same as another tribe telling the story. It, mm-hmm. the, 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 they match up so well. And, and so where there are differences, perfectly. and where there are differences, you see that actually in the text, and it's dealt with so carefully and beautifully. Right. Because in in Old Testament, uh, it's called textual textual criticism. They're not criticizing the text; they're analyzing the text. And and people that know the original language is far better than than Garrett or I. They sit down with this and they notice, for example, in Genesis, there are at least three lines. The the common idea was four at one time, but there are at least three, definitely two, uh, threads of the Hebrew story coming together and being synthesized in the book of Genesis. Mm-hmm. One is called the J-source. Why do they call it the J-source? Because whoever, wherever this tradition comes from, uses the name for God, Jehovah. The E-source uses a name for God, Elohim. Mm -hmm. And then you have the Yahweh name over here, which is a different source, the Y. And then you have D, Deuteronomic, which is the compiler trying to get his hands around all of it. And when you pick up an English Bible and you just see the word God or right. you just see the word right. Lord, because those are the only words we use, mm-hmm. it we don't see everything going on behind the text. In fact, if you're watching tonight and you've got a Bible and you've got an English speaking uh, English Bible and all the modern translations do this. If you look in the Old Testament, I just flipped open to Second Kings 20 right here. Hezekiah had had asked Isaiah, what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me? And Lord is in all caps. Mm -hmm. Whenever you see that in the Old Testament, they're not talking about sir. They're not talking about generic God. They are using either Elohim, Yahweh, or Jehovah, the proper names of God. And that's throughout the entire Old Testament. You get to the New Testament and it changes. Lord is used lowercase because they're usually speaking to Jesus as sir or, you know, Mm -hmm. anybody else that they're speaking to because that's the Greek text that they're, they're, they're sticking with. So all that comes together in the Old Testament. And so you have this period of time after... Uh, the Babylonian captivity to about 150 years before Jesus, where the Hebrew community, they're the only one that can do it, sorts out their business. This is scripture. This is not. Mm -hmm. And they're a much more cohesive community. So they could gather their scholars, their faithful, faithful people together in a place and work that out. And they did. And so you come to the, to the time that we call between the Testaments, this 400 years between the Testaments, and the bulk, not all of it, but a bulk of the material that is in the Apocrypha, those 12, 13 books, is intertestament uh, stuff that was post-Septuagint. Or if it was during the time of the Septuagint being formed, it didn't meet the 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 standard that the rabbi set for what was scripture it was still valuable uh if you pick up a, a, a lectionary the revised common lectionary for protestant churches sometimes you'll even see uh, you know a reference from the apocrypha hmm. in there uh the book of maccabees one maccabees and two maccabees in particular fantastic they tell you about the jewish revolution of the period that led to Jewish to, to re- Jewish rebellion and Jewish independence for a period before Pompey and Julius Caesar and the Romans come over. Fantastic books. And they're much more about context and provide they provide a lot of context for the coming New mm-hmm. Testament. Of course when they're written there's no concept that the New Testament is coming. But that's where the that so that's question the second question. That's what the Apocrypha is. There's absolutely no danger whatsoever in studying it. It's good for you. Uh, it's not considered scripture in the classical sense, but there's, you know, in the Jewish world, there's the Talmud, the Mishnah. That isn't scripture, but it's commentary on the scriptures. 
and it's it's invaluable mm -hmm. for Jewish scholars. It's good well, yeah. comments. Are we are we are we you and I just talking alone here? Is anybody? Oh, we have, we have people commenting. Hey, hey they're hey, saying people. hey to each other. It's, hey, y'all, good stuff. So uh, the person who asked about the apocrypha, I hope that helps you. Uh, I don't. I mean, I've got a copy on my laptop. Braden is using my laptop. Do you know why Braden is using my laptop? <laughs> because Braden is so far behind in his schoolwork that he is now in lo severe lockdown because he's so lazy. So he's having to finish his <laughs> schoolwork. So he has my computer tonight. Uh, but I have, you know, I have a copy of the Apocrypha on my computer. I don't have a physical copy. I have fewer and fewer actual physical books. It's been a hard thing for me because I like a book in my hand. But I've tried to go more and more toward digital, digital just to save space. But uh, you can buy a copy. You can buy it cheap. Or you can probably download a free copy on PDF if you want to check it out. Uh, it reads a lot like the Old Testament. And Which uh, is fun and exciting. It can be. <laughs> some of it is de dead as a stick and dry as a stick, but, but some of it is, is really, really fantastic. So that brings us to the New Testament. Gospel of Thomas stuff and how... The bigger question here, to, to and I hope the person who asked this question is listening tonight. The bigger question is, how did we get these particular 27 books? Yeah. And why were some of these uh, left out? It's not all that well... No. <laughs> what happened? I don't mean like, oh, you don't know, but I do. I'm saying that historically, it's weird. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's very weird. Um, so, <clears throat> so let's let's say it like this. Let's say, let me find my my list of the New Testament books here. I got them here somewhere. Here they are. So in the New Testament. You've got one, two, three, four, five categories of books. So the Bible is a library. And in the New Testament, which is the this wing of the library over here, inside this one wing of the library, there are five different reading rooms. First one's Gospels. The second one's History. The third one is the Pauline Letters. The fourth one is the General Letters. And the last one is the Apocrypha. One book in the Apocrypha, the Book of Revelation. Four Gospels, one history book. Paul 13, I think, give or take, when I'll get to that. And then you have the, the balance is made up of the, of the general letters. Now, we come along 1,500 years after the fact and everything is in place and we think that's just how it always has been. That is not how it has always been. The books that we have in the New Testament <laughs> are reached general acceptance by 400 A.D. Now, a lot happens in the early church before 400. 400, uh, 3 to 400, is really the turning point in early Christianity. Why is that? The minute that Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire, 313, the Edict of Milan was issued, and it took another you know, five, six years before it became Christianity. Well, it started like this. The Edict of Milan, Christianity will be tolerated. By 325, Christianity is the state religion, and out come the swords, and everybody takes the knee. Right. Conversion by force, <clears throat> which is not conversion. Anti, anti, the antithesis to everything Jesus of Nazareth was about. And then that sets off Christendom, and that's 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 a topic for another day. If you're interested in that whole Christendom idea, put it in the comments or send a text to Garrett or myself, and, and we'll get to that in two weeks or something. But I, I just don't have time tonight to get into to all of that. But by 400 A.D., the what we have as the New Testament was pretty well regarded as... Scripture, uh, but it wasn't easy 
because rather than the cohesiveness of the Jewish community that hammered out over a couple hundred years what their scriptures were, you had very distinct flavors of Christianity by its very nature. You had a uh, Palestinian Hebrew-based Christianity. You had an Egyptian-based Christianity. You had a Roman Christianity. You had a Constantinople Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so all of these are, have their own flavor. There's no recognized single leader after Paul's death. Uh, and particularly after John's death, John the Apostle. Mm -hmm. He's the last of, of the 12 disciples. And we figure that he dies about 100 A.D. So as they launch into the second century, a lot of things are up for grabs. Doctrinally, what does the church believe? What are we really about? You have all these different heresies. Uh, and there was church fights. But no, nothing was, nothing came to blows. Nothing came to swords and axes. Yes. That doesn't happen until the state gets involved. And then when the state mandates that Christianity is the law of the land, then what happens is at that point is then, then you see the bishops of the large towns, Rome, Jerusalem, Constantinople, uh, Egypt, Ephesus, they begin to weld enormous power because they have access to the emperor. And this is a very broad statement. But after 313, 325, in the Western church, Oh, this is just awful to have to. I, mean, I can't believe I'm about to say this. Should I get the mute button ready? No, <laughs> no. All theology. Oh God. Now this is just too. This is too general. So don't lift this out of context and go quote me. But all theology after 325 in the West for a period of years is suspect because it's aligned with power. Mm hmm. Yeah. Now that's that's. Crazy to say, but you came from a movement, the restorative, res restorative yeah, rest movement yeah. that, that you can probably speak to that about what that's all, what are you, what are you trying to restore? What are you trying to get back to? It, right. The unity, uh, unity amongst the churches, unity amongst, uh, the congregations because everything became so, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, it, it kind of goes back to what you were saying just a little, a little bit ago, even through, uh, you know, the second century, we had all these different groups, uh, different branches and sects of Christianity within a relatively short period of time. Uh, they, some people had uh, fragments of the New Testament. Others had a different segment and fragments of the New Testament. Um, some believed different theological perspectives based on what they had available to them at the time. So, you know, the restoration movement comes around and basically their push was for unity amongst the churches, unity back, amongst getting back to, back yeah, to getting, the roots. Yeah, getting back yeah. to the roots, getting back to the Bible. Well, we, we talk about the phrase radical. Oh, he's a radical. The word radical means root. Radish. Radish. That's yeah. exactly it. And so we're talking about, oh, that's a radical thing. That's my neighbor going by. Hey, Stephen. Stephen's got a train horn on his truck. That, I don't know if they can hear a, that, but it'll scare you to death. That's a uh, very country boy kind of thing. Ah, he's actually an African American man from Atlanta, so go figure. That's fantastic. It's wonderful. <laughs> I love him. Uh so radical is is root back to the the heart, the beginnings. And you can really stumble there. You can go, we, we just need to go back and do what the disciples did. Well, we have to be careful with that because they lived in a different context. We can't it's oh, impossible to do that. But you can get back to a more primitive, dare I say, simple faith by I like comparison. What, I like what you did there. You like that. So you have this, this period. In my, my doctoral dissertation, one of the theological, how do you solve this theological conundrum that we're in in the 20th, 21st century where there's so much opinion and so, you know, so much fragmentation. Mm -hmm. And part of what I wrote there was not so much to get, 
we need to get back to the disciples because the disciples theology had not been worked out yet. But what I did say is to get back to the patristics. Mm-hmm. The patristics are the church fathers right. and mothers. And the church fathers, church mothers are those group of believers that lived from about 150 to about 300. And then later, there's a second generation of church fathers in the Eastern Church. The Eastern Church never aligned with the state the way they did later, but they never made that that initial alignment in, in 325. They were too far from Rome. Mm-hmm. They're on the other. They're, they're only they're on a, in Asia's border country. So so they're not under this this authority of of the Roman Empire because they weren't part of the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. So that Christianity grew up differently and was shaped differently. It, it's um, it's it's uh, it's much more, for lack of a better term, spiritual. Eastern Christianity is mystical. It's less concerned with the magisterial reformers and thus saith the Lord and 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 the minutia of the Word of God and 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 here's what was said at Cathedra, there's less concern about those things because, again, it has a different context and a different flavor. But the patristics, the earliest patristics and then the desert fathers, seven, eight hundred A.D., uh, that were part of the Eastern Church, when you, when you lay down their work and you look at the corpus of their work, it is incredibly mystic. It's incredibly centered on Jesus Mm-hmm. It's incredible in its scope about what church ought to be and should be. And it it really gathers that early baptismal covenant of. So now there's neither male nor female. Jew nor Greek. Slave nor free. But you are all one. That's the preaching of the patristics. Right. And. uh they, they were just open, much more open to experience God rather than read this book about God. And that's weird to us in the Protestant world. But that was my solution. And uh, I, still, I still think that's a solution. There's not, a, there's not the solution, but that is still a solution going forward is to return to that patristic roots of our faith before power and wealth and and all that got involved i'll I'll just grind my axe here because i got like 10 minutes left and even what's what's amazing even in the even in the midst of trying to get back to that um you know that's essentially that's what the restoration movement tried to do was Mm -hmm. get to that and even when you get to the simplest you know foundational principles of what Christianity is about and how we should apply it, how sh- how we should teach it, interpret it. Even then, you see branches stem off from what they're attempting to do. Drastically different approaches, too, based on, once again, interpretation. Yeah, based uh, on how they view it, is it God-inspired? Is it infallible? Is it inerrant? And, and what you find is that you know, there's a long history in the church, Catholic and Protestant, of abusing groups and counting them as heretics for leaving the party line. Mm-hmm. And again, the, the church has no credibility. And this is as pertinent today in 2020 as it was in 325. The church loses all credibility when it aligns with power. Mm -hmm. the powers killed Jesus. And that's that's another whole other (laughs) discussion about how that works. But I'll, I'll say this and then answer the question. The Pope, the Bishop of Rome, I'll go back there, the Bishop of Rome and the Emperor, the College of Cardinals and the Roman Senate, Ex cathedra to speak from the throne. The church, the Western church, 
took the structure of the Roman Empire, lifted it, and used it. Mm-hmm. And when the Roman Empire collapsed, you can the argument can be made historically that the church saved Western civilization at that point. Okay, I'll give you that much. But the structure and the power in the Middle Ages, when the, the high Middle Ages, when 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 the Catholic Church really reached its peak of power, just before the Crusades and then and a little bit after the Crusades, it was the most powerful force the world has ever seen at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's why the the Reformation was such an explosive event. And the reformers oh, right, were trying right. to get back theologically. But mm-hmm. the craziest thing in the world, Calvin, uh, Luther, Zwingli. they kept the structures. They kept the structures, and they kept the power management over the people, even as they were trying to get back to theological, the theological radish, back and, to the theological root. And there's, so much, there's such a dark cloud that hangs over that time frame, oh, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we, <laughs> that's and another we time for that one too. Uh, so, 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 but to the point, how did we get the Bible? how did we get the Bible? Okay. How then did all these books, these 27 books get in? Thank God. The majority of these books, the 27 books we have as the new Testament were in place and accounted for before power got involved. So just as just as the church is beginning to surrender its power to the state, what we have is the New Testament already had a shape and a form. So what happened was that bishops got together, and, and bishop was a much different term then than now. They didn't have you know miter hats and and white outfits and that that sort of thing. They got together regionally. What? What scripture are you using in your location? And what scripture are you using? And what you begin to see is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all emerge by the end of the first century and are circulated as authoritative uh, accounts of Jesus' life. And they had widespread uh, adaption and adoption. Acts did as well based on Luke's credibility. And then you get to the Pauline epistles and the general epistles. And some of the books were quite barely got in because of disagreements. James was late to get in because James is such a Jewish book, even though James was a Christian. <laughs> uh, it was such a Jewish book that by the time the Gentile church is wrestling with the book, they almost said, no, this, this can't be right. But it did get in. Hebrews was very late getting in because it was a second century book, probably one of the later books that's ever that's, that's been written. Second Peter and Jude got in by the skin of their teeth because they are much more like what is read in the Apocrypha. And they both make references to apocryphal books. And then Revelation was late to get in as well because it was late written and a little bit beyond the pale as far as how it matched everything else. So there are some, this is how these books get in. Number one, it had to have been written by an eyewitness of Jesus or a close associate. That eliminates Mm -hmm. a lot. A lot. You know, the letters of Polycarp, for example, are written in the early second century and Polycarp was a direct disciple of the Apostle of John. And his letters are beautiful to read, but they weren't treated as Scripture because he had never witnessed or seen Jesus. He was just, had that Kevin Bacon six degrees of surrender. He couldn't quite get back. He was with John, but John was the link back. So his letters didn't get in. The Gospel of Thomas in particular. The Gospel of Thomas comes late to the game. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had already been accepted by the time the Gospel of Thomas arrives. A late discovery and no consistency whatsoever about authorship. There is just no case that Thomas is actually 
the writer because it's written too late. Mm-hmm. Now, that does not mean that the Gospel of Thomas does not have sayings of Jesus in it because you can lay the Gospel of Thomas down and consistently find parts of Mark, Matthew, and Luke within the Gospel of John. But there's also cases where Jesus turns a playmate into a monkey <laughs> because he gets angry. I mean, there's things like that mm-hmm. that strike against his credibility. So it, it fails the first test. It was not written. The early church did not feel that it was written by an apostle or a close associate of an apostle. Uh, that's standard one. Standard two, the text has to be consistent with the prevailing voice of the other texts that are being accepted. So if something is too far out of bounds, then uh, it, 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 was, it was rejected. That's what made Jude, Second Peter, James, Revelation harder to get in because they, are, they have a different viewpoint than so much of the rest of the New Testament. And then finally, the, and this is very experiential. And people who, this strikes at the plenary verbal inspiration piece, but here it is. They felt those early, earliest councils, and I'm not talking about the, 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 the Council of Nicaea or those things. Those come later. But those early councils, those bishops and pastors just looked at each other and said, does this book feed and edify your congregation? Does it work? If it worked, it had a chance to stay. If it didn't work, it had to go. So when you see that big story, this idea that God is speaking and the hand is just moving, the Bible is God-breathed and God-inspired, but the Bible is as human a document that has ever been produced Mm -hmm. because humans' hands are all Mm -hmm. over it, even how we arrived at what we have. And that's not to take away from it at all. It doesn't take anything away from it. It broadens the view. Uh, and, it, and it shows that, you know, a book written over 4,000, that covers 4,000 years of human history, that started out as oral tales being told. And the gospel started the same way. Just like the Abraham story, you know? Mm-hmm. The, the early church was passing around the Jesus story orally. Because they believed, and this is another another question, they believed that he would be back in their lifetimes. And when people started dying, and it was seemed hey, this is going to take longer than we thought, they started writing it down before the witnesses had all passed. Right. Yeah. So we have uh, we have about eight minutes left. You're getting into it, man. I got fired up, didn't I? Sorry Fire, about all that. Fired yeah. up. Um, so there, there's a few questions here. I'm going to ask one real quick. Um, so how trustworthy and reliable is the Bible? Uh, th- there's some of the dynamic view of inspiration here. The Bible as a pointer toward Christ is completely reliable. The Bible as containing every bit of of correct historical names, places, dates, it won't hold. We we can take you to the to the uh, the account of Jesus' birth in Luke chapter 2. And in those opening verses that Luke talks about when Quirinius was governor of this, mm-hmm. those are all out of joint. That's just the first one that comes to mind. Those are not where they are supposed to be. But Luke is intentionally doing something else with that text. Right. His point is not, here are the exact, exact historical dates where this happened. He is pitching Jesus as the true son of God born during the time when Augustus Caesar was already po- proclaiming to be the son of God. And, and usually when you see the, those discrepancies, especially in, in the Gospels, it's not necessarily that it's uh, that they're, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? In contention with another. They're not, they're not another. frauds. It, it's the, they're not fraudulent whatsoever. You're dealing with multiple traditions. 
they're trying to reach a different group of people they're as trying well. To reach a different group of people, and you and you see it especially in the Old Testament, in the Kings and the Chronicles, mm-hmm. where the same stories are told but different numbers are given. Right. Those are the again we've talked about it tonight. The multiple uh, traditions coming together, and what did those old wise sages do? Rather than saying this one's right and that one's wrong, leave them both. <laughs> and, and usually, leave them both. and usually. When things were absurd or appeared to be absurd, there's a reason that's there too. Yeah. Because there, there are so many things that uh, you know, we use the word subversive. There's so much below oh, so that's much. so much below the text that um, you know, unless we're there in that context, unless we're there, you know, living in the first century or 500 BCE, you know, in that time frame. These things aren't going to make a whole lot of sense in the English language and to us here now in the 21st century. But uh, numbers, uh, I, uh, you know, phrases and, and different things meant something else during that time. I, like the 153 fish. It, well, why 153 fish? What 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 does a, it, that was Jesus's way of saying I, I am God. God, one five and three. 153. Yeah. You know, the, to us it's. Why do we need to Why know about? Why did the about? gospel say 153? <laughs> exactly. Fish? It's a it's a it's a subversive message to communicate to the church at the time. Absolutely. So if you see those discrepancies, now, now that does not mean we need to get into the Bible code. No. All that bullshit that's <laughs> out there these days, which is just like, you know, religious conspiracy. Theory. Writing down the numbers and yeah, everything. Yeah, that's that's doing the mathematical. Yeah, that's, um, so, uh, Marco. Asked, Marco, my man. Did Bob Dylan have anything to do? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, t- Tim asked Tim asked a good question. It's not necessarily uh, thanks, Marco. D- <laughs> directly um, related to the translation of the Bible per se, but he Tim asked, "What do you think the other versions of the Bible, you know, such as the Quran or other versions of uh, interpretations of God, other religions, um, are they just?" different views of the same God or are they different? This is like a whole different discussion. That's but, a great question. Um, are they a different group with the same view or are they just a completely different group in religion and view altogether? Okay, I'll, I'll go back to my prescriptive descriptive. When we read the Hebrew Scriptures, when we read the Christian New Testament, we are reading real people's real experience with what they perceive to be God. Right? Mm -hmm. Other religions are recording people's experience with God. All religion gets in trouble. Christianity, Judaism, Islam, to a lesser degree Buddhism, because they're not much book thumpers. (laughs) Hindu. (laughs) They will all get in trouble when they say, this is it. My interpretation is, it. <laughs> is right. And they impose their prescription on everyone. Now, well, that sounds to me like you're saying Jesus ain't the way. I am not saying that at all. But I'm saying that Jesus isn't standing in the way, which is the way we usually interpret that verse. And we've got Jesus Yes, we do. We get Jesus. How about you? No, y'all don't. So we're in and y'all are out. Careful. I don't think that's at all what the text means. Ooh, that's a that's a Pandora's box. It for is a, for it a is, later time. It um, is. Well, here's here's a, a kind of like a, a sub point to to that. We have two. Is, Islam? How did Islam come to be in the first place, okay, Ronnie? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that question later. Uh, because we don't have time. We don't have time. We do not have can, time. We we can I briefly say, really it it's as a result of Christianity. Phil Parshall, I'll, I'll give you this, and then we'll save it. Phil Parshall, who was a missiologist for years, that's not even his real name, because he was a Christian. Phil plant, Collins. Phil Parshall, because okay. he was planning churches in Islamic countries. Mm-hmm. Uh. He states that Islam is a Christian heresy. I'm just going to leave it right there. 
That is people not, hanging. That's a good cliffhanger. That it is not something new and different. It's a Christian heresy. But I, I won't get into it tonight. Here's what I'm going to talk about next week. Can I do that and wrap it up? Yeah, do we want to give uh, folk just a couple extra minutes just for fun? If you've got questions, you have to post them now. Uh, Jeff asked the Wayless way. <laughs> Jeff. Um, well, Jeff, what I was just saying about those religions, and to go back to Tim's question, uh, that is pertinent to what Tim asked in, in a roundabout way, what I was saying. I gave Jeff this phrase a couple of weeks ago, the wayless way, and it's not original with me. It's Meister Eckhart, who lived 800 years ago. He was a German mystic monk, and he had, I love this. In fact, it's what we're doing right now. He had these things he would do with his students called table talks, mm -hmm. and they would just gather, and they would chat and questions, and he was always asked about, how can I really know God, how can I really follow Jesus? What's the best way? And it was Eckhart who coined the phrase, it's a wayless way. And his students said, what does that mean? And he said, Jesus is everywhere you find him. And you're going to have to figure out your way of following him. For some yeah. people, a serious prayer life, that's where it's at. For other people, it's meditation. Mm -hmm. For other people, they read the scriptures and God, Christ himself, seems to really speak to them. For others, it's serving the poor. For others, it's, it's going to work and, and putting in what your hand finds to do, do it all to the glory of God. Right, piece. yeah. The wayless way is you, you are a unique, uniquely born, uniquely gifted beloved child of god well thanks man you are i know well I... and so is everyone out there listening thus god will communicate with you and you back to god in your unique way <clears throat> within the context of following jesus i believe with all of my heart that jesus is the way to know god and i believe with all of my heart that we have made jesus eternally smaller than he really is yeah the wayless way the wayless way i wish that's what my scale would say when i start <laughs> the wayless way Quarantine. all right all right yeah let's let's get to you next week i'm going to put this on you this person says this and I'm, i won't reveal the person great text message right here i saw the prayer list today this is a few days ago i saw the prayer list today and my mind went to my age-old struggle of what good is prayer for those in need as a person who struggles with my belief in God and God's ability to help people and are asking God to help people by our prayers. So I thought if anyone else struggles with this, maybe a topic or some variation of this for a Wednesday night talk, just a thought. Hope this makes some sense. This makes complete sense. And so we'll talk about how is God actually active in my prayer, in my life. Back to another individual who asked me a very similar question in light of the pandemic. And that was the whole idea of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I think this text message and that person about feeling forsaken by God, have we been forsaken by God? I think those go together in the way that we trust and seek God and look for God's activity in our lives. Thanks for listening tonight. I got a little carried away. I got all fired up because we got into one of my favorite things to talk about. And uh, I apologize for those of you that are asking what's in the cup. Just water. I swear because it was hot out there today. Garrett, thanks so much for uh, being here tonight and making all of this happen. And uh, for all of your technologically technological abilities and all the technological growth that you've had over these last seven weeks to pull all of this off. And uh, we'll see you Sunday morning. We have a an incredible surprise Sunday morning that you are not going to believe. 10 o'clock. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Was a time of a preacher When a story begun
Well, she left him. For 